Uh, nobody told me this was supposed to be insightful, so that, that was promised. I'm not sure that that's actually going to pan out. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. This is how to talk to your boss about GraphQL. Uh, and we're going to be talking about thinking about strategic technical discussions. So if you're in the wrong room, well, tough. Before I get started, I wanted to give a special shout out to Tommy over at uh, Hasura. Um, definitely stop by and spend some time learning about that product. Not only is it one of the best technical decisions that I've ever been a part of, but uh, I picked his brain extensively for this. So if uh, you don't agree with any of this, blame him. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great guy, great team. All right, so in classic presentation form, first I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, we're going to cover the big questions, like who am I, why am I here, what are we doing here? Then we're going to talk about planning your strategy for these sorts of conversations. We'll move on to understanding your stakeholders. And we're going to wrap it up with uh, some fuzzy stuff about thinking about a shared language. All right, so uh, I've had a couple questions about what this talk is about because I confess the title's a bit on the marketing side. Uh, so I want to explain in, in uh, I guess, academic form by explaining what it's not. So the first thing it's not is a step-by-step -step guide on how to persuade your colleagues to adopt GraphQL. It's obviously a big technology. It's a big spec. There's a lot of stuff changing. And even the three years I've been following it, everything's sort of different. So it's, it's sort of impossible for me to give um, bespoke information to help you win those discussions uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, and the second thing, it's not as a general guide on how to say technical things to non-technical people. That's a super important skill set. It's not one I'm particularly interested in talking about today. Uh, so what is it? Uh, so strategic technical discussions. I, I want to define that by looking first at normal technical discussions. So these normal technical discussions you're sort of having on a day-to-day -day basis with the people around you, be they the product, the designers, whomever you need to, to uh, sort of uh, explain things, learn things, and arrive at the optimal technical decision. Ideally, uh, these are predicated on things like facts, objective reasoning, analysis, so on and so forth. They're sort of like you can sort of feel the correct answer coming out of these things, and they're, they're pretty easy to wrap your mind around if you're a, a, of the engineering persuasion. Um, the size is commensurate with that, right? So these are decisions that are local to your team often or to your portion of the company. And if you happen to pick the wrong database, for example, for a project, your company's probably not going to go under. So uh, they're reversible and compartmentalized, which makes them a little low pressure. That said, though, if you get good at them, you can get a reputation as someone who can clearly communicate and make smart technical decisions on these things. So that's why it's important uh, to many engineers to want to be good at these things and to prioritize uh, being better communicators. So let's look at strategic technical discussion. So uh, ideally, these are also based on uh, data and facts, but there's a much fuzzier people element to these. Uh, there are a lot more uh, uh, stakeholders involved that will want to have a say. And this is primarily because these decisions tend to be much larger in scale. They could affect the entire company. If you make a decision of this magnitude wrong, uh, you might have some explaining to do to uh, the shareholders in a few years when uh, things are going poorly. So they could be as big as you want them to. Now, GraphQL obviously isn't necessarily of this uh, size, but it certainly can be. It has the potential to be uh, uh, dramatically large. And so you should expect that a lot of people are going to want to have a say in that sort of discussion. Um, and then commensurate with the size of these discussions, these are the sorts of things where if you do well, they're career defining. right? So if you're good at uh, these massive technical uh, architecture changes, this can be the sort of thing that sets you up. So this is one of the, uh, these are the reasons that I think we should care about these things. So as I said, the ability to talk about technical things is definitely requisite in both of these. Uh, the tools we're going to talk about today are meant to pick up where those leave off in this latter bucket of conversations, because I think they leave engineers falling a bit short of uh, where they ought to be in terms of uh, persuading decision makers. So about me. Uh, I actually got my start in the um, uh, military. Uh, I was, uh, worked in strategic defense acquisitions. Technical changes there take a little bit of time. Uh, an example I like to give is that I graduated from the Air Force Academy, and some of my friends are flying the same B-52s their grandfathers flew in World War II. I don't mean the same model. I mean the same aircraft. So that's, that's I mean, maybe some of you with COBOL in your code bases are not so surprised by that sort of thing, but I always found that pretty interesting. Um, anyway, so I punched out of there, I went to business school, I hung out with the management types for a little while, sorry about that. Um, and I, I got to see how decisions in general were made, but also technical decisions there. Uh, eventually I ended up in tech, I learned to uh, build products and uh, learned to speak engineer, um, but I didn't forget how to speak those other things. So the, the long and short of this is that I've had the opportunity to be a participant in, or at the very least a fly on the wall for technical change at a variety of scales. Um, and, it, and given that uh, uh, and my uh, intellectual interest in sort of communication and how groups make decisions, um, it's been a pretty, I, I've had the opportunity to make a lot of observations and uh, think about this stuff a lot. And so that's what I hope to communicate to you here. Uh, so the title was um, 
again, something I've had a few questions about, and I just wanted to share where I got the inspiration. Uh, this is a pamphlet a friend of mine gave me. Uh, she thought my cat was getting involved and maybe running with the wrong crowd, so she wanted me to have her prepared there. So nice gift for uh, the cat person on your Christmas list, available on Amazon. All right, so before I get into the, the, the nitty gritty, I wanna emphasize something. The, the tools and tactics that I'm gonna talk about here are, uh, in my opinion, very useful, but they're certainly not gonna be a panacea. They're not gonna be the solution to all your problems. Um, if I could solve all your problems, I'd probably be uh, charging a lot more than free for this speech, but uh, the, uh, the bottom line here is that the, uh, we need to take a step back in these sorts of discussions and think about them as a project. It's not just trying to win um, a discussion about a certain technical adoption. It's not a matter of being right uh, being right doesn't really mean anything when you're talking about these large scale organizational and uh, technical changes. Um, the important thing is that you're thinking about it. So even if you can't sit and map a plan from A to GQL, um, as they say, a friend of mine uh, quotes this all the time, plans are useless, planning is invaluable. So that's the important thing I want you to take away here, irrespective of whether or not my tools work, I want you to start thinking about these sorts of large scale multi-party discussions as a project in and of themselves that are, uh, warrant your thought and strategizing. Speaking of strategizing, that's gonna be the first uh, tool in our toolbox. Now, if you're anything like me and you think about strategizing in the context of interpersonal and, inter and uh, professional communications, it makes you feel a little oily, right? People who are strategizing these sorts of communications, uh, I often wonder if they're telling me what I wanna hear or if they're telling me what they genuinely think. Nobody likes that. But what I'd submit to you is that strategy is not necessarily politics, right? We don't like office politics, but dramatic pause for water break, we are totally okay with strategizing if and only if uh, it has the potential to get us where we want to go in these discussions. So strategy is not the opposite of being a straight shooter. You can plan these things and not be uh, uh, weird about it. At the end of the day, there's a million ways to tell a story this complex and all I'm submitting to you, uh, if you are skeptical like I am about this sort of thing, is that uh, you pick the right one, the optimal one for your situation. All right, so the first uh, actionable thing here is understanding the various stakeholders' influence. Stakeholders is a word I hear constantly in, uh, in my previous life in business um, and in product management as well. Um, it's not something I think that uh, individual contributors or, or people who are primarily focused on engineering really think about um, a lot, uh, which is good because it's a pain in the ass, but uh, um, it, it's uh, one of the first things I want you to think about when you're starting to plan this discussion. So the first step here is um, defining stakeholder. Stakeholder is anybody with a Pokemon in the fight. Uh, interesting fact, I originally had dog in the fight, which is a popular idiom on this slide, but I like animals a lot, so I wanted to remove that. It was only once I put Pokemon there that I realized that Pokemon is, is really just uh, animated dog fighting. These kids are training these animals, they're fighting out, like that's some dark stuff. But that's not why we're here. Uh, so so uh, now that you understand who a stakeholder is, you gotta think, who are my stakeholders, right? There's some easy answers here. You got your back-end engineers, your front-end engineers, the data science team, the engineering managers, so on and so forth. Um, what I'd like you to do in these, uh, for decisions like these, especially like GraphQL, where we're talking shift, uh, adding, as they mentioned in the keynote this morning, adding this new abstraction to your stack that has a potential to touch uh, uh, countless functions across your organization, right? Um, I want you to think about that broadly and understand who these people are and how they might be invested in this decision. So uh, someone that you might not have thought was uh, interested at all in this sort of thing, if you can figure out how it might impact them in a positive way, you may find yourself a new ally in this discussion, right? The data science team, for example, could a graph architecture benefit them? Were they a part of your original uh, thinking about who should be a part of this discussion? If not, maybe it makes sense to bring them in. Um, and the word influence in this title is a bit fuzzy, but I just wanted to hit it. It's, it's, I'm not gonna go as far to define it, but I think we know influence when you see it. So recognizing who the people you need to win over are, uh, the, the ways in which their influence interplays with one another, and just thinking about that as a graph of decision makers for your GraphQL endeavor, I think is the first step uh, for strategizing these conversations. All right, so the next step is gonna be recognizing the broader context. We know who our stakeholders are, but what world do they operate in? Uh, so for example, if your front end is not particularly important to your bottom line at your company, uh, some of us, uh, at my company it is, but at many companies it's not, um, or if they already move pretty fast and they're not actually a bottleneck to delivering value to the customer, maybe it doesn't make sense to emphasize so much the uh, value that GraphQL delivers. The conventional wisdom on the trade-off for GraphQL adoption is that the back end team puts out a lot of effort uh, in an effort to make the front end team just get whatever they want uh, basically in perpetuity. Um, that calculus is a little more complicated than that, but um, if your situation doesn't lend itself to that calculus, then you should find different calculus. Uh, 
Uh, it's not only important, by the way, to think about where people, people's heads are at right now, where the business is right now, but also in the horizon. When you're talking about these like, strategic level decision makers, a lot of what they spend their time thinking about is not where the business is today, but where it might be in five years. And since technological adoption like this is going to be a long process, most likely, um, and the uh, effects of it are going to be essentially permanent, I think it warrants you to search anywhere you can for advantages and uh, a deeper understanding of um, how to sell this. All right, so, oh, that's a funny, oh, the animations went backwards on that one. All right, uh, once you understand who these people are and what world they live in, I want you to think about the actual things they're going to push back on, right? This is a, I did debate in college because uh, I was a, a pretty cool guy and still am, and, and one of the things we did was thinking about um, expected arguments, right? If you can think about the argument before they make it, you got to leg up. That's a pretty sweet place to be. So I'd like you to start, uh, uh, once you understand who these people are, start thinking. Um, and if you can't really think about what they might uh, want to argue about, then you can inventory your own weaknesses, the weaknesses of your own argument. Um, for example, GraphQL is uh, one of the things that has not quite settled yet is the caching discussion, right? It's not clear how to solve caching, whereas in the REST microservices world, caching is a bit more of a solve problem. Um, so if that's, uh, that might be one of your weaknesses, and so you may want to have answers ready for that in the event that that comes up in the discussion. Uh, but more importantly, know your stakeholders, right? If you know that uh, caching is sort of a, a, um, a sticking point for uh, someone with a particularly high amount of influence that you're worried about winning over, um, have a really good answer ready for that argument. So it's, it's sort of, uh, again, building the graph of the landscape where you're going to make this argument and understanding it deeply and intimately. Now, uh, once you, uh, so once you have those good responses ready, I want you to remember that it's not about necessarily arguing. When you're selling things at this level, when you're worried about the people involved in these things, it's not about winning the argument. Uh, it's about being flexible. So for example, if the backend team really loves their, uh, their REST APIs and they don't want to leave those, well, why don't you use GraphQL as a way of, uh, as a, a, a BFF, sort of, the, uh, uh, take the data from the REST API, serve it to the front end, everybody wins. Nobody has to sacrifice here. GraphQL adoption has a lot of different shapes and sizes. It could be as small as you want it to be or as large as you want it to be. Uh, it's, whether, it's up to you whether or not you want to start small. I think you probably should, but uh, it, you need to be aware that uh, the uh, shape of that adoption is just one tool in your toolbox for winning this uh, advocacy of yours. Excuse me. Everybody wins. That's the sweet spot of a good deal. Nobody feels, either nobody feels like they lost or everybody feels like they lost. If you walk out of a negotiation with, without either of those outcomes, then you have lost. So now we're going to move on to the second tool in our toolbox, empathy. Bit of a buzzword lately. Uh, I recognize that. But I think it's a pretty important concept, and I want to dig into it with an example. So. Since I got out of the military, I've helped a couple friends find jobs. And one of the things that is a continuous sticking point for military folks is their resumes. Uh, the conventional wisdom holds that military resumes are just too replete with jargon, acronyms, et cetera, uh, that a hiring manager really couldn't understand what's being sold here, and they're not interested. And I hear all the time from my friends, my friends who have fought in wars, done amazing things, um, that they just don't have what they are looking for. And, and the emphasis always seemed interesting on, on this day. It almost felt as if they felt uh, my friends were perceiving these hiring managers on the other side of the resume as this big faceless mass of arbitrarily applied rules that were just going to reject them outright because they used an acronym instead of a fully spelled out thing. And I always thought that was interesting. Uh, and so what I tried to get them to do was something that I think uh, you and I do uh, pretty much every day, which is uh, put ourselves in the shoes of the person for whom we are designing an interface, right? Um, and so I'd ask them, like, if you were, the, you know, the standard, if you were hiring for this position, what would you want to read on a resume? And that's fine. That, that gets the ball rolling. But you, you can't stop there, is what I would tell them. You have, to, you have to take it deeper. You have to get weird with it, to be frank. You have to try to see the world as the person, as the hiring manager in this case, uh, might see it. What's their job like? How do they measure their own success? And crucially, how would the position that my friends are applying for affect that success? Excuse me. And I think this seemed to help them because it put a human face on this person who before was just this concept, right? It was, this person only existed on the other side of the resume insofar as uh, uh, my, my friends would perceive them. They're just the person that was going to give the up or down vote. And so once they saw them as sort of a human, then it was really just writing a note to someone, right? It was jotting stuff down. It became much easier to grapple with this and reason out what they ought to say, the arguments they ought to make, the things they ought to emphasize, so on and so forth. And so my point in all this is that when we're trying to figure out uh, how to make our case to these people, to these stakeholders, 
it's crucial that we don't just stop at understanding someone's el someone else's position. I want us to really try and see the world as these folks see it. So, so a more relevant example, perhaps, say your backend tech lead, she's pushing back on GraphQL. She's got some concerns about security. She thinks that the current authentication system is battle tested, it's hardened, no reason to change it, and rule number one of engineering is what? If it's not broke, don't fix it. Perfectly reasonable argument. And you can make counter arguments and you can mitigate her concerns. Uh, but what I'd submit to you is that if you, you try to reach across that disagreement and just understand a little bit more her position, maybe there's some backstory here. Maybe she lost a client at a previous business because of some sort of security risk, and she's particularly sensitive to it. Now, that objection in that context seems a bit more relatable. It seems more understanding, and, and your impulse is different than just to argue back. And had you not stopped thought, and thought deeply about this, uh, excuse me, had you not stopped and thought deeply about just, uh, you may have just plowed through and burned a relationship in the process, right? And so, it's, it, like I said, it's a bit fuzzy, but I think it's crucial here to um, see across these arguments. Remember that these are people with their own battles, with their own difficulties, with their own priorities. And if you don't understand those on a human level, then I think you're doing yourself a disservice and you're going to have a much harder time bringing folks onto your team. Excuse me. And I think the practical uh, tactic here is to just question each and every one of your assumptions, right? You had an assumption that she was just a, a, a curmudgeon for uh, restful uh, best practices and didn't want to move on that. You dug a little bit more, you got to know the person behind the argument, and um, you were able to see things from her side. And at that point, maybe you decide this is not a battle worth having. Maybe there's some permutation of my uh, GraphQL rollout plan uh, that lets her win, right? Give her that win, bring her onto your side. Uh, so being flexible comes in here, but I really think it's just seeing across these arguments and, and seeing the other person um, and putting yourself in their shoes in a big way. But remember, just because you're selling doesn't mean they're buying. You can't win every battle. Some uh, are not worth having. Um, and so you have to be aware of that, too. It's a broader strategy. It's not just about persuading this person or that person or winning that argument or that, that argument. You have to identify the outcome when you start. If it's GraphQL adoption whole hog, uh, that's what it is, and that's the only goal. It doesn't really matter how you get there. Obviously, it does matter how you get there. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter what uh, uh, sacrifices or co compromises you have to make in, in getting there. So um, the other thing is that, uh, and I was having a conversation earlier about this, and I thought this is interesting. You can present the um, solutions that GraphQL is going to bring to your team, to the front end team, to this team or that team, and you can rebut the objections that someone might have. But what if you flip that a little bit and tried to figure out how GraphQL could solve the problems of the people you're trying to persuade? Right? Then the discussion is not about, oh, well, security is going to be fine, caching is not a problem, so on and so forth. It's, here's what I can do for you. Right? And you know, don't get too salesy about it. Leave that to the sales folks. That's, that's not our job. But uh, I think some of the tools that sales folks use can be uh, gracefully applied here to just sort of reconceptualize. And back to questioning each one of your assumptions, you set out to sell this particular uh, technology. And before you know it, you're solving everybody's problems with this with the appropriate uh, strategization. So. Um, and at the end of the day, if you just you decide you can't um, win this person over uh, and you need their support, sometimes it's just easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Maybe it's appropriate to just start a smaller project that uh, executes what you need to do without involving multiple stakeholders, prove that that works, and then the question is about bringing that winning project forward as opposed to getting stakeholders to agree some, to some theoretical payoff. So, uh, results speak a heck of a lot louder than words, which is uh, maybe I ironic for someone giving a 25-minute presentation on words. But if you can get those results, then just skip all this stuff and do it. That's my opinion. All right. So uh, you've, you've, sort of, you've figured out who your stakeholders are. You've figured out what they care about. You, you, know, you've, uh, you understand they like puppies. And, and uh, you've done all this uh, soft, fuzzy stuff really trying to get inside uh, their heads. How do you have the conversation, though? And that's where we're going to talk about common language. Excuse me. So this one is, is uh, I'm still working on this one. This is, let me know what you think about this idea afterwards, or use the, the forms. Um, but uh, I think that the, the, the moment in the keynote that really spoke to me this morning was uh, this notion that we are adding a piece to the stack, right? And for anybody that works in a company with more than one team, which is presumably all of you, um, you know that the, uh, the absence of common language in between teams is a major problem. Right? It slows things down. It, it makes it harder to get on the same page. It makes it hard to move forward as a single unified force uh, for good in the world, which is, of course, what we all consider our companies uh, to be. 
And so the notion that you can put this abstraction in the middle of your stack that is not just like a data layer, right? It's a knowledge graph. This knowledge graph has all the entities your business gives a damn about. And that's really something. That's like living, breathing documentation that evolves and changes as your company does. So setting aside all the technical advantages of GraphQL, I think there's really something here. Crucially, though, abstractions, I mean, we know this, right? Abstractions serve as a common language. They're how we talk to people um, about things uh, that both parties don't necessarily have a deep, intimate understanding for. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the nice thing is that they don't always have to dilute substance. You can use abstractions here that tell the story better than a detailed, nuanced explanation ever could. That's sort of the sweet spot, right? So I want you to be thinking about those abstractions and seeking out how they can help solve these conversational problems better than a, a verbose, uh, detailed explanation might. I think a great example of an abstraction here that helps you communicate with maybe non-technical people is technical debt. Right? It's a great example not only because it communicates the concept without sacrificing a lot of substance, but also because it focuses on the impact of the technical change and not the implementation. And that's a distinction that I think is important. I think our natural inclination is to, is to explain the implementation of technology as opposed to really emphasizing what impact that technology can have. So while I think abstractions are important, I also want to emphasize again, this is more about selling than explaining. When you're in these strategic discussions, it's not just about explaining why this is going to work, why this is the best path. You're selling this. And if they're not buying it, then you are failing in your endeavor. And we don't want that. The nice thing, though, is that GraphQL is fantastic for abstractions. For all the reasons that I mentioned, um, this could really, in my opinion, be the, the foundational language amongst your teams. If, you're, if your teams have any difficulty uh, uh, communicating on these sorts of things, then um, I think this might be a winning argument for you. Um, let's see. All right. Excuse me. So uh, you got a large organization, a lot of teams. They might have their own sets of APIs and services. If you can bring them together in a common language, that's good. But what's even better is that GraphQL, in particular, enforces all sorts of standards and stuff that you would just have an absolute nightmare enforcing with regular human-powered systems. Uh, for example, you might have one team that likes to maintain its REST APIs with certain idioms, with certain uh, naming conventions and so on, and you might have fields that are uh, the same field in practice, but in, uh, excuse me, the same field in, in actuality, but in practice are named slightly different things across different APIs. I'm sure we've all been here before. It's a pretty standard problem. The nice thing about GraphQL is it sort of, uh, they go from, uh, your teams go from maintaining a series of services that they have to um, answer to the uh, uh, clients for to maintaining a common resource, right, with a standard and documented and enforced set of idioms and best practices that are built right into this data graph. So that's sort of another thing. You get to enforce this sort of normalization across your teams without really having to enforce it, without having to burn some of that, you know, uh, uh, human, uh, th those hours trying to enforce these policies. And if you've ever kicked back a PR because something was named wrong, you know what I'm talking about. All right, uh, but at the end of the day, I think that the, the thing that GraphQL does for us that's really nice is just gives us a, uh, in, this, in this arena, is gives us a, an abstraction that's just a lot nicer to think about. So we know what the diagram on the left, your left, is, um, and we know what the one on the right is. And I would submit to you, uh, conceptually speaking, which do we think here is easier to have a discussion about? All right, so that's, uh, that's me. Uh, so the recap here. I'd like you to recognize which technical discussions are strategic and then spend the necessary time thinking about those and planning those just as you would the actual technology under, that you're going to be discussing. Because even the best technology in the world doesn't mean anything if you can't get it uh, implemented. I want you to understand who your stakeholders are, what they care about, and why. Really get yourself in their heads and just sell. And I want you to figure out how to speak their language, speak to their interests and concerns in a language that's common to everybody. And GraphQL is a great tool for that. All right, so come work with me. I work at a great tech startup. We have traction and funding and a lot of AI. So if you're in San Francisco or anywhere else in the world and you like that sort of thing, give me an email. Thank you. <laughs>